the headline back into basics, but we're, we're going back to basics, and sometimes it's quite good to, um, you know, just find out, to sort of follow the steps to get a good result, and that's where uh, I want to go through today. Uh, and as John has said, it'll be good if you guys have any questions along the way, or if you have anything you want to add to the slides, and uh, so we can just discuss about things, and uh, you know, perhaps maybe I can pick something up as well. But anyway, so I put out an outline, which is sort of the the, the core things, the basics, uh, the, the preparation before you actually even go sailing, um, what you do sort of before the start to get to get ready for a race, and uh, what you need to do to, to be a better sailor, to win. So we'll go uh, through this one by one, and then uh, if you have any questions along the way, just let me know. <coughs> So, um, as I said, we're really going back to basics, and this is uh, this is actually something I do every time I go sailing, depending on where I go sailing. So if I go, uh, you know, if I go out for a for a race at um, uh, Kela, uh, out in the Costa Bay here, uh, you know, if I got an 11 o'clock start, I need to go back to steps to what I need to do before the race uh, so to make sure I'm sort of always on on time. And I mean, I, I suppose this goes for everything in life, but. This just makes my life a lot easier because, you know, I need, I, I know when I need to leave the house, when I need to change my gear, when I need to do everything step by step. I just, you know, remember what time I sort of need to do. And um, this is just for me, but even more so if you sail on a, on a big boat, I, I assume we got people sailing, you know, everything from dinghies up to big boats here. But even more so if you sail with, the, with other people that, you know, you send out a, a schedule like this, you know, the night before or, or a couple nights before, so everyone knows when we're off the dock. Because, you, you know, if everyone knows that, then, uh, you know, at least everyone can potter around and do whatever they want before then. But at that time, leaving the dock, you go out. And when you go out, you know what to do. You're going to do, uh, you're going to do your warm up, you're going to do a, a sail up wind to, to check the things, and, and then eventually you're going to check the start line before the start. I have a question. Yes. Jim. When you have your first sail, do you prefer to do it alone or with another boat? Um, yeah, that comes sort of into the the warm up. That's a really good question. I'm actually going to go more into this later on. Okay. Um, it depends a bit, you know. If I it's a bit, if I got access to another boat right next to me, it's quite nice to line up and check for speed, especially if you're sailing one design. Then it's really important. Uh, if you sail in an IRC boat, a keel boat, it doesn't really matter that much because you run the numbers anyway, so you <coughs> according to the numbers. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'd suggest it's a good idea to at least line up with, with one other boat uh, for a few minutes just to get a feel for it. Um, so, as I said, I mean, yeah, I'm sure people here sail everything from small boats to big boats, but uh, if you sail a, a laser, it's quite easy. You're doing everything yourself. You can't. Uh, Really separate any of the roles from the boat. You have to make sure you can uh, you, you can do it all yourself, uh, and it's a lot easier to control the time. But the bigger boat you get, you know, if you're sailing a, a Jellic or a, even you know Scallywag, you get a ton of people on board, and everyone needs to know the role on the boat. So here are just a, a few of the sort of core roles on on the boat, uh, starting from bow. You got mast, pit, trimmer, main helm, and tactician. And I think it's very important to do, you know, if, if you're doing a very important event or if you're doing a Saturday afternoon racing, it's, it's equally important to always um, get involved and, and own up to your role. And what I mean by that is if you're the bow, and uh, there's a lot of bowmen in here today, as you can see, um, if you're the bow, you need to sort of own your area on, on front. You need to set up the cut sheets, you need to set up uh, jib sheets, well, that might be the trimmer, but you need to set up all the, uh, you know, what sort of sails and how your systems work and all that. Same with the mast, sort of uh, help out with the halyards and so on, with, the, with uh, <coughs> talking with the bowman. Pit, obviously need to organize everything on the boat, uh, from all the halyards and all the, all the fine-tuning lines that you got. Um, trimmer needs to, to make sure all the sheets run fine. And most of the time, it's the trimmer that sort of decide together with the with the guys at the back of the boat what sort of 
head sail you want to want to use. And uh, you, you know, as soon as you get on the boat, that's why you need to start thinking about even even before you leave the dock. Sometimes you need to think about which sails you need to be using. So you know, I think it's very important. And this goes even down to a, a double-handed uh, dinghy. You know, if you're a bowman or if you're the front of the boat, you sort of have your areas. It's a little bit easier because you can sort of uh, separate the tasks that you want to <coughs> sort of do. When I sail the double-handed boat, you know, I had my sort of jobs on the boat, and I made sure that those areas were always up to par. You know, all the ropes were good. If anything broke, I had to fix it. You know, of course, you always help out, but it's easier if you split all the tasks up between all the all the members of the boat. And I know it's slightly different because if, if you know sometimes here in Hong Kong, you know, you got a boat owner, and a lot of people expect the boat owner to you know make sure everything is all right. But uh, <laughs> I see a lot of owners that not their head here. Uh, but I think it's important that you know all the crew try and, and help out and, and sort of make sure that their area is up to par. You know, it also comes down to sort of boat, boat and sail set up before you go sailing. Uh, what you need to prepare before you go sailing, you need to check the forecast. You know, are you expecting it to be a light wind day or a heavy wind day, or, or, or you expect it's going to be changing weather? You know, it's, it's, it, you know, we're talking back to basic, right? So it can be as easy as, you know, we're expecting rain in the afternoon. It's going to be cold, we need other clothes. Um, it, you know, are we sailing windward lured or are we sailing island race? And that's mainly for the bigger boats, what sort of sail setup we should bring. You know, if it's a light wind day out in a typhoon series, perhaps you just need to bring the, the light wind sails. But if you check the forecast and it's going to be windier in the afternoon, you, you need to make sure you, you got, you know, you, you're prepared for that. The same with rig settings, obviously. Uh, if you're out for a, a whole day, you know, can I control my rig settings out on the water? Uh, if so, it's quite easy to change it, so I can set it up before the first race for the expected wind conditions. Um, but if, if I have problems changing during the day, maybe I need to find a setting that works for the whole day. So, you know, if it's 8 knots when I get out, and it's going to be 20 by the time we get in, you know, I might think about tuning that rig a little bit tighter than, than uh, what you expect. Um, and, you know, down to food and water, uh, which is very important, some sunblock and all that, you know, really key things for a long day underwater in Hong Kong. Um, so, when you leave the dock and you go out on the water, I think it's very important um, to have a sort of checklist. And uh, I think it's even more important if you're a kind of guy that just go out sailing on a Saturday afternoon. If you're, a, you know, if you go out on an Impala on a Saturday, a Saturday afternoon, or if you go out on, on a Jade in Milan, you know, if you just have your sort of mental checklist, it makes life so much easier. Um, and I, I, I basically run the same checklist every time I go sailing. If it's the world, or if it's the, uh, you know, non-important regatta. Uh, and it's just to make sure that I just get into the whole sailing side of things. Um, you know, I, I start with a warm up, which could be, you know, anything from a few tacks, just to make sure that all the sheets run okay. Uh, you know, just do a couple of maneuvers uh, and so on. And I can sort of com combine that with the second one, which is check boat speed, trim sails, and just make make sure everything feels feels comfortable. For um, you know the current wind conditions, going out sailing edgels, you know you, you you basically sail to the start line, and then you sheet on and go for a little upwind sail. And you get a feeling for how much wind you have, you know what sort of range you got. You get a feeling for what sort of uh, um, wind changes you have and the, and the current and so on. And uh, what I'm typically looking for is that the, the boat is just set up right, so I got a good speed. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to take any shifts or anything like that. I'm just making sure the boat goes fast. There's everything else I can do later on. Um, same if you go out on Lama. You know, you, you've got a long sail out to Lama. Uh, most often, you've got a long downwind. You can sail past a little. Uh, there's a little marker halfway out that you can check the tide. Um, so instead of just, you know, chilling out, relaxing on the way out to the race course, 
all you need to do is aim for that mark, and at least you can check the tide on, on the way out. And, um, and, and then you know the prevailing tide. At the same time, you know, maybe two times on the way out, you just go head to wind, unless, unless you've got wind instruments, just go head to wind, check the wind direction. So by the time you get down all the way to the start, you know what it's going to be sort of on the, on the left-hand side of the area in, in terms of direction of the wind. Uh, and that, you know, llama is very typical because you, you usually have a different wind direction as you go out. But that goes for anywhere really. You can just do you know, a couple of spot checks and, and see what the wind is, the wind is like. Uh, third one is an obvious one. You know, check the, check the course. But you know, I was watching the Olympics last time and I saw a boat sailing the wrong course. So it, it can happen to anyone. And it certainly happens to um, you know, quite a lot of vegetables every, every weekend in Hong Kong. And I'm sure it happens in all the different classes. But it's such a basic thing, you know, you, you keep the sailing instructions in the pocket. Before the start goes, you need to just sail up to the, court, uh, to the race committee boat. And just make sure you take the course. And, and if you're on a bigger boat, I'd like to just run through the course, especially if it's not island course, uh, or in the harbor, harbor course. I run through the course with everyone on board. So, you know, you, got, you, you take a couple of minutes to get everyone back in the boat to to just discuss it, so, you know, uh, preferably I'd like to have someone that just looks at that stuff, so they can introduce the course to everyone else, you know, we're going to do a short beat here, do a reach over there, and if it's a reach, maybe on a big boat you need to discuss what sails you should have, uh, on a class boat, um, say Flying 15 or Impala or Dragon, you need to, you know, discuss, do you think we can hoist the kite on this, on this leg or, or not, you know, should we just ignore it, or should we just see at the time. At least you discuss it beforehand, so all the crew on the boat are ready to, you know, ready for that kite, if that's what you've been talking about. Or um, if you come close to that first mark and the, the bowman doesn't know, he can quickly just ask the skipper, what do you think, what, what are we going to do, are we going to set up, are we going to pull up, or, you know, what are we going to do? So everyone sort of, all, all the crew on, on the boat needs to be aware of what needs to be done and, and always have that conversation what you, you need to do. Because there's nothing worse, you know, you get to mark and half the boat thinks we're going to do this and the other boat half thinks we're going to do something else. And it's, you know, it's just mayhem. So, these are things you want to prepare before the start. Right? Uh, four, I got uh, create your master plan, which is, you know, typically, you say if you start with an upwind sail, um, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Are there a lot of shifts? Uh, I go back to the harbor as an example. You know, do we want to, uh, if you tell me actually, you might want to go across the harbor. Do we need to do it straight after the start? Can we wait 100, 200 meters, go across? You know, if you're sailing on the other mark, um, do you want to go close to the coast or do you want to, you know, get rid of the tide or do you want to sort of do a couple of shifts in the middle? So you, you need to have a master plan. and. Most of the time when you see boats just going out in a corner, those are the boats that don't have a, a master plan. They, they don't really know where they want to go, right? So they have a bad start and it doesn't quite pan out the way they want, so they just do basically whatever comes by, you know? But if you have a master plan, at least you, if you get a bad start, you can, you can tack, get free, and tack back to where you want to go. Yeah? Uh, so that's, that's really important. And, and then, the final check is, is the start line, which I'll get into a bit more. Let me know if you guys got any questions along the way. So this is, uh, this is something I, I reckon everyone should do before the start, and this is a little bit complicated, I suppose. So this is the race committee boat, and this is the, the, the pin end. What I want to know, uh, obviously, which side of the line is, is biased, and there's a couple of different ways you can, you can do that. So. I always stick to the most basic one, which is basically go up head to wind on the middle of the line. And if, if the wind comes straight uh, from the above, this is what we call like a square line. It's 90 degrees from the boat. So there's no, there's no bias on this line. But if the wind would come from, from the side here, the boat would be slightly tilted. And you usually have something symmetrical on the boat, like winches or uh, a, a traveler or you know, something like that. You can just follow along the boat. And then you can see if one mark is above the other mark, um, you know, it's easy to see where it's, where it's biased. 
Anyone got any questions on that? Another way is uh, simply just going ahead to a wind and check the compass course. And if, you know, say this scenario, you got uh, zero degrees, you point straight to north, then you just take minus 90 degrees, and when you sail the line from one end to the other, you can see if it's, uh, sorry, 270 degrees. If it's higher or lower than 270 degrees, you can see which side of the, of the line is biased. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, now you have to take into consideration, you know, if, if, if the left hand side is biased, the pin is biased, but I really want to, my master plan is to go to the right hand side, you know, you got to weigh the options. Is it really that biased that I want to, you know, maybe be squeezed out without being able to attack? Or should I start in the middle to make my options a lot easier to, to attack away? You know, so, so quite often it's not about winning the, the favorite side, but rather having the options to follow your, your master plan. Now every scenario is different. So, uh, the other one, I, I got sort of a 90 degree angle here, and these, these are sort of ley lines to the mark. Uh, and it's really important, you, you want to take both this ley line here for this mark, or slightly above it, as well as for the committee end, where you want to point sort of at the end here. And the reason why I do that is because if you line up before the start, you want to do a pin and start, and, and you line up where this boat is here a minute before the start, uh, this boat is not going to have a good start. Because you're going to drift, a unless the tide is that way, the boat's going to drift a little bit sideways, and there's no way you're going to make that mark. So you need to know the ley line for the pin end, and you need to add up, you know, how much do I drift sideways for accelerating? How much do I drift sideways per half a minute, for instance? So if you want to be here a minute or, or two minutes before, you need to know how much you sort of drift down. And this is, you know, if you're ever below the ley line, ley line you just need to board. You can't, you, can't, you can't hang around. So often I see people that, ooh, they think they have a really good pin and start, but, you know, there's no way they're going to make it. And you can see it 40 seconds before the start. But they still try until the last second, and you know they're never going to get a start. So if you realize 40 seconds before the start, this is not going to work. Or even 20 seconds before the start, the sooner you realize it, the sooner you can just jive away and, and just go into the to the start a little bit and try and find a spot. If you can't find a spot, you obviously just got to keep on going. But usually there's a spot or two where you can sort of line up. But the, the important thing is that you need to bail out early. You can't wait around. The same goes for the committee end, but obviously on the other side, because you don't want to get pushed in to the committee end. So you always want to be sort of inside that ley line, or just at the ley line, because there's always someone that can block you, and can go ahead to wind, and, and, and you know, funny enough, on, on a club racing is where it mostly happens, when they don't really care about if they get a good start, they rather have you having a bad start. So sometimes you need to uh, take that in consideration. Quite often on typhoon series, by the way. Um, uh, what else? Oh yeah. So and transit of the line, which I think uh, most people do. You know, you line up either just outside the race committee boat or just 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 inside, um, and you just look along the line, follow this into transit, and uh, you know around Hong Kong is really good because we usually have a mark. So you, you know, in the harbor, you got a little pole building here, and that way you know when you're in the middle of the start line here. If, if you're up here, your transit is going to be below that little flag, green flag, and if you're below the line, it's going to be the opposite way around. And I mean, it, this is really basic stuff, but the, the thing is, you need to do it every single time. You need to have a routine, and when you do it, sometimes, like the way I do it, I just start coming up here, get my transit, sail in here, do my head to wind, and then, you know, I get my uh, angles up to the mark, and that takes, you know, less than a minute. And less than a minute, I, you know, I, I'm so much more prepared than most other boats out there. Uh, so it's, this is a very basic thing. Um, some bigger boats got GPS and stuff that you can ping the line. Which they're, they're great tools. Um, even if you do have that, I would still go through this routine because you get the transit at the same time as you ping the GPS position anyway. So you might as well do this sort of uh, analog way of doing it because sometimes the electronics break down or, 
or you're actually relying on another person. The thing with the transit is both the bowman can get a transit, uh, the houseman can get a transit, uh, you know, whoever on the boat that needs to help out with the start can get a transit. Any, any questions on that? No? I have one comment. Yes. Lawrence Mead, who's one of the best stars I've seen in Hong Kong, yeah. checks the line more than once. Yeah. That's, That's a really nice. good point. I mean, obviously, because the wind changed, tide changed, and plus, not only that, because it's probably part of his routine, so instead of just hanging around waiting for the start, he just keeps on doing the same mantra, I suppose. And the, the more you do it, the more comfortable you feel with it. You know, the second time you check the transit, you're like, yeah, I knew it was there. You know, you, you sort of get into it, right? So I can, I can see that. I think that's a good idea. But this is sort of the, the minimum, I think. Um, how to win? Well, this is the easy part. Speed. <laughs> uh, that's my philosophy, in a way. Speed is so important on, on the boat. And... Um, you know, take all, all <coughs> tactics aside, I find speed is, is absolutely key. You know, if you have a bad tactical race, at least if you have speed, you can sail faster than those around you and you get more options. You get off the line, you get good speed, you get more options. So speed is, is absolutely crucial. And it, 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 I mean, it's, you know, it might be obvious, but the reason why I put it up there, because first it's so important, second of all, I think people sort of forget a little bit, you know? You start sailing, uh, you get off the line, you're more worried about the boat next to you, uh, then you sort of forget about just getting the boat up to speed. Um, and and uh, especially the more people you have on, on board the boat, you need to work as a team and, and get the boat going. Um, you know, if, if you have someone controlling the main sheet for you, or if you have someone controlling the jib sheet, you know, if the boat is a bit slow, you need to to, as a team, help out to get the boat going. You need to ease the sheets a little bit, lean, lean on it a little bit, you know, bear away a little bit, and, and get the boat going. Um, you know, second is obviously crew work. Uh, you know, again, teamwork, but you just need to, to be able to talk a lot, not shout, but just talk a lot <coughs> and, and make sure everyone knows what you're doing. Tactics and, and strategy. I think I'm going more into details here. Let me see. <coughs> yeah, so just starting with speed. Uh, there's so many parts of it, but you know, like uh, I put high performance boat and classic boat first because obviously on a high performance boat, say a sports boat or, or um, you know, these new modern RC boats, they're very crucial on how you tune it to get it up to speed. They're probably easier to sort of go from a I always have three modes on a boat. You got sort of normal mode, where um, which is you know the fastest BMG, which means velocity made good, which means your speed to where you're actually going. Uh, so upwind, you know you're zigzagging, you're sailing upwind, but the BMG will be if this is the start, this is the mark. You're sailing the boat this way, but your BMG is how fast you're actually approaching the next. Next mark, John might correct me if it's towards the wind or towards the mark, but you know, upwind is generally towards the, the wind. But um, so, so if you have a normal mode, that will be the fastest BMG, and that's when you see on the boat and feel like we're, we're pretty high, but we're still pretty fast, you know. Then we got the fast mode where you, you crack the sheets a little bit and, and get going, and sometimes you really need to, to get into the fast mode. And if you're several people on the boat, everyone needs to know what a fast mode is. Uh, and same with a high mode. Everyone needs to know what a high mode is. Um, the reason why I wrote high performance in a classic boat is because classic boat, like an actual or, or a dragon or slower non-planing boats, have a smaller span of, of fast mode. Still have a fast mode, just not as much. You can probably play a little bit more with the, with the height and, and normal mode. <coughs> You know, like a dinghy, like a 29er, 49er, and, and, and those sports boats, you can really get fast if you want to. Uh, you know, obviously, you, you need to know if you've got the correct sails on. Uh, and that's mainly if you have uh, different jibs, like the Etchell's got two different jibs, mainly light wind and heavy, heavy air wind. Bigger boats got a ton of different jibs, so you need to make sure you're on the right, right sail. 
do you have the correct trim? Uh, and that's where you start talking between the crew. You know, are we, are we in fast mode? Then, you know, the jib trim can't go for you know, sheet on tight. If we're on a fast mode, he needs to know that we're in a fast mode so he can ease off or travel down or whatever. And the same with the same with the main sheet. You need to ease a little bit. And sometimes those modes are quite short, so you just go for 10 seconds to get the boat going, fast mode, and then you go back to normal mode. Um, way in the right place, very important in any boat, uh, dinghy as well as a big boat, you know. Um, are we sitting too far forward? Are we sitting too far aft? You know, most boats are, are quite easy to, to see, but you know, even like an obvious boat, like an Etchel, like we sail, <coughs> you still move the weight around. And, and a lot of people just sit in the middle, but you can actually do a lot with the waves and so on. You can move the weight back, backwards and forwards. Uh, boat heel, uh, most boats are designed for a, a typical heel. And this is uh, what I would classify as the sort of feeling for the helmsman. If you got the right feel, that's when the boat's the fastest. Uh, and it's really important that the, the you know if you have a high aspect main uh, mainsail, that the main trimmer knows what the right heel is, because he can look at this mainsail and think, oh, this is a really beautiful mainsail, you know, trim it perfectly. Whereas the helm is sitting like fighting it because he thinks the boat heels over too much, so he's going sort of pinching a little bit instead. So the communication between the trimmers and the, and the helmsman, uh, they're really important. But that obviously goes down to uh, flying 15 as well. You know, like if you feel that you're sort of tipping over a bit, it's possibly easier, well, faster to ease the main sheet a little bit rather than pinching with the boat. Um, what else? Yeah, so I went through the high, normal, fast mode. Uh, footing and pinching is quite good as well, uh, which is a, sort of a concept of <coughs> upwind. Uh, when it's um, you know, when when the wind is oscillating, you want to know when you sort of can can foot off a bit or you can pinch. So the the grand theory of it is that you know if you're on a on a big lift, and if you're on a, say port on a on a big lift and you're above the whole rest of the fleet, you might want to secure your spot by just going fast on top of everyone else. So you, you ease the sheets a little bit. So you go fast. Let me show you. Fast above everyone. Um, <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, all right. So what I'm saying is that if you go start out here, and then you, you're down to the lure and you attack, you've got a lot of boats here, and the wind is lifting, so all these boats are lifting, that's a big lift then you might want to go in a fast mode here to be able to get from having the wind <coughs> coming from here the next one is going to be maybe a right hand shift so you want to gain as much speed on these boats as you can so when you attack the next time they're sort of behind you rather than if you go in a high mode then it will be opposite that they can actually go to the next shift quicker than you can and there are different scenarios one is if, if the wind is oscillating back and forth like that you probably want to go in a fast mode quite often um, if you if you get sort of locked out on the corner and you're you know if this is the ley line and you're out here and you're on a lift you definitely want to get in towards the track as much as you can because if you get headed a lot you know you don't have a lot of room to tack out um, so that's uh, sort of uh, footing and pinching um, pinching you you don't really want to do it too often it's mainly if you know, if you're on a header, but you can't tack, you just want to sort of stay there as long as you can, but you know, try to avoid that, I suppose. And uh, funny, funny enough, never stop working on speed. You know, always talk speed. If you have a, a, a speed thingy on your boat, you know, you, you're gonna do seven and a half knot. Make sure you do seven and a half knot. If you're not, someone needs to call it out all the time. We're a bit slow. We're a bit too fast. We're a bit, you know, you need to talk about that all the time. And even on smaller boats, um, but instead of looking at your uh, speed on the boat, you, you look at boats around you. You can reference to your, your next door neighbor. You know we're a little bit faster than him, but we're actually a little bit lower, or we're, we got you know same speed, but we're a little bit higher or whatever. Because all that input, um, you know, you, you, in general you have one one person on the boat 
the reporting back. But everyone can hear it, which means that everyone is working on the speed. So the helm can sort of adjust to that, and then the helm might go, okay, we're, we might be pinching a little bit much, too much here. We're just going to crack, crack off a little bit, get some more speed, which means that the trimmers straight away knows that they're going to have to ease a little bit. And we're talking, you know, small things. Um, yeah, trimmers always communicate with the helm and tactician about the speed and, and everyone knows what's going on. Uh, crew work uh, goes back to what I said before. Everyone needs to know what we're doing. Uh, but more importantly, if you're, you know, if you're uh, perhaps not part of the tactical decisions on the boat, you still need to think ahead what's going on. Um, you know, if you approach if you approach the ley line here, you better know that you're actually going to attack very soon. You can't just uh, it can't come as a surprise to you. You know, you can't sit around and <laughs> wait for the skipper to say, you know, we're attacking and I'm going to give you three second countdown because that's what I always do. No, you need to be prepared. Uh, you need to be ready for attack. And you know, same thing if you're on port tack. You know, there's going to be a lot of starboard boats, and you might not see in a position where you can see it, but you, you should know that any time you might have to tack away. Uh, and obviously if you come up closer to the top mark, you need to know that you know if you're going to go around and hoist a kite, what do I need to do, you know? I can't sit around and wait for, for other people to, oh, get the pole up. No, you, you know that that's your task, so you're just going to get ready for it. And, and, and especially bowmen, you know, obviously they need to, um, you know, if you've got different spinnakers on board uh, and you don't know which one to choose, perhaps you want to ask, other people, you know, the, the person that decides which sails you're using, which sail you're using, and, and get it ready. Uh, so you're not going to get to mark and don't know what to do. And obviously the crew is not stronger than the weakest link, which means that even if you have someone that is not as experienced on board, you still need to brief them, and perhaps you need to tell them a bit more than everyone else what you're going to do. You know, what's what's the next thing that's going to happen, and uh, you know, help out. Definitely, the helmsman could help out as well. He can't just sit there and, and shout at other people. Um, yeah, tactics. You, you just gotta. This sort of gets into building your whole master plan before the start. You know, what are the wind shifts doing? Uh, Harbor in general, we have, you know, more oscillating breeze, but parts of it is. You know, you, you know that the wind's going to change at certain places. Llama is completely different because uh, you quite often have that left-hand shift when you go up to Llama. Uh, Repulse Bay, I suppose, is different because you got massive sh oscillating shifts. Um, so you need to take those into consideration. Uh, at the same time, as you look at the tide, uh, the tide in the harbor is, is very easy to, to know how it works. You just look at the chart in here, or you look on the observatory website, and if you completely forget everything about that, you can just look at the, the seawall when you leave the dock. You now, is the water almost at the high mark, or is it very, very low? And then you can look at the ships around and see which way it's going, right? Um, so that's sometimes what I do when I forget to check. I just sit, look at the seawall, and if it's almost all the way up and it's still coming in, I know it's going to change soon. Um, but then you need to figure out if it's really strong tide, and if it's really you know, if it's really strong tide, you might have to neglect the wind shift a little bit and focus more on the tide. And if um, uh, vice versa, if, if it's just a little bit of tide but massive wind shifts, you need to you need to wait. What's more important? Should I focus on the on the shifts or on the tide? And, and quite often it could be a combination where you have to sort of avoid the tide a little bit, or you can stay in the tide and so on. Uh, clouds is probably um, more important if you're out. Um, on, on an open area like Clearwater Bay, uh, you can see, you know, when the big clouds are rolling in, you can expect the wind to change. Uh, so you always keep an eye out. Um, but even in the harbor, you sometimes see big left-hand wind shifts coming from the north when the big clouds come in. And uh, you know, land formation I think is really important because everywhere we're sailing in Hong Kong, you've got land next to it. So land formation uh, changed the wind a lot. Um, you know, again, looking at the harbor, you can get massive uh, northerly breeze coming over the hill. Because if you actually look at the chart, maybe I should have had that. But if you look at the chart, 
you, you have the whole sheltered cove and then just a little mountain and then you go straight into the harbor. So you get those gusts coming over the mountain hill and just gonna roll in. So you get nice left left shift at the sort of kayak area. Um, whereas uh, you have the same thing going on with the ferry terminal but from the other direction. Um, so you know, keep an eye out and, and figure out what you think the wind is gonna do. I think this is a whole different topic that we can discuss because land formation is quite difficult. Uh, other obstacles, obviously, uh, prohibited zone ferries and barges and stuff we have in the harbor, but even in, in Lama, you've got big ships. Uh, those things can't come as a surprise because they, uh, they always appear. So you need to take them into consideration, and especially when you get like a barge coming through downwind with you that could block a whole course you need to take an early decision are we going to go in front or are we going to have to sort of wait for it to pass and, and, and then go behind so you, you sort of almost need in the harbor at least you need one guy just to look out for trap uh, mark roundings uh, should I sail to the ley line or should I underlay should I attack before the ley line so, when, you know, th these are sort of discussions when you sail, you know, and the reason why, I mean, not often would you actually go to ley line, even though most, most boats would do it, because if you get a lift, you're going to sail to long distance, and if you get a header, well, then you miss the last shift that you can actually gain. Um, so, unless you really want to get out of the tide or something like that, then you go to the, to, to the corner, right? But most of the time, you can easily just tag you know, 50 meters underneath the ley line. And if you're lucky, it's going to lift. You're pretty good. And if you're unlucky, it's going to, well, you're not really unlucky either because it's going to head you and you're going to take a nice tack out. Um, so, you know, it's very dangerous to sort of go all the way out to the corners. And you need to discuss that as you go as well, go upwind as well. Um, I wrote exit high or exit low. And what I mean that, because it's around the mark, you need to decide uh, pretty much before you, you reach the top mark if you want to say if you sail an asymmetrical boat if you want to exit low or if you want to exit high and what I mean by that is that if, if you sail an asymmetrical boat quite often if there's traffic around you you always want to just go high out of it because you never ever want to get a boat on top of you that rounds behind you and go higher the reason why you want to go low would be, well, I want to go sail downwind on this side, so I want to be able to tack as we dive <coughs> early, uh, and I, I want to make sure there's no boats blocking or anything like that. Uh, but the, the same thing goes for, you know, spinnaker boats. If you want to go high or low, well, if it's a big fleet, uh, if you look back at the Etchell World, for instance, there were a lot of boats, and pretty much everyone exited fairly high, because if you didn't, there's just no wind in here, no wind at all. So everyone sort of needed to line up to have a clear air and went all the way out here. Unless if you really wanted to jive, then you can go low mode and just jive off early. At the same time with the spinnaker, you're going to have a lot of boats on ley line here. So, uh, you know, in bigger fleets, it's probably more. So you just want to get out a little bit. Uh, yeah. Downwind, uh, downwind mark roundings. Always exit close, and this is such a uh, sort of rookie thing that when you when you go downwind, you sail downwind, you go around this mark, you want to exit close, right? So it doesn't really matter how much space you got here, you want to exit uh, on the wind as close to the mark as possible. And sometimes that, that's quite difficult because you got you know four boats next to each other going to the mark, and you know if you're out here, it's, it's quite tricky to get it good rounding, obviously in here it's easy, but out here it's a little bit difficult. So you just gotta bite the bullet early, you know, if you have a spinnaker, drop the spinnaker early, slow down the boat, and be able to, you know, when all these boats go around, you can just line up behind, rather than, you know, sort of behind, rather than out here. Because out here, you're gonna have dirty air for the next five minutes, unless you tack, which is also gonna be a hassle, and maybe you don't want to tack, so, you know, always exit. Exit close and never exit outside another boat. Ah. I think that's it. That's it.
<laughs> that was some basic stuff. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I hope there's a few questions and we can discuss. Yeah? yeah, just about the exit. Yeah. So, of course, we don't want to exit behind the other boats, but if we need one boat in front of you, so which way you go? I mean, yeah. For me, it's sometimes so I say basically down. always exit first, right? So, the, the problem we got with exiting first when there's a lot of boats around. So let me see if I can draw this. So this is the mark, right? Say you have uh, a couple of boats here coming in, uh, like that. And now you've got a three boat length zone. So these, these guys are already inside the three boat length zone, which means that this boat, well, as soon as he's inside the three boat length zone, he can sort of slow down and go inside behind the boat, because whoever comes in and get overlapped after the three boat length zone, does not have overlap, right? So he can sort of relax a little bit and, and really get, you know, prepare for a good rounding rather than getting, you know, squeezed behind those boats. Um, obviously, if you're outside the three boat length zone, you need to make sure you go inside first because otherwise you're going to get the next boat coming here and he's going to have more room and then it's like a never ending story. So, it, you, know, you know, if it's really crowded, you might have to think about it a little bit earlier, you know sort of five minutes before you reach the bottom mark. If you have six boats around you, um, how can I make sure that I get a good rounding? And it, maybe when you're up, up halfway down to the track, you have to go jog behind everyone and you're last in the fleet. But by the time you get down to the mark, you know you got to have the inside uh, mark ready. Um, so yeah, I mean, it takes a bit of planning, to be honest. Any other questions? Yeah. Another one is uh, about uh, the cool, cool, cool way. Yeah. Sometime in in, uh, in a good wind day. Yeah. So either we put more people on board in order to compensate the the, the boat wheel, the boat, boat wheeling. Yeah. Or we put the less people. Yeah. Keep the boat light. What do you prefer between this? I would say almost always better to put a lot of people on the boat. You mean uh, maybe more, enough, more enough crew rate? Yeah. I, I, I'd say all class racing, I would think you sail up to the maximum crew rate. Unless it's a very light planing boat, like a moth or you know, like a 49er or something like that. That's, that's different. Um, but any heavy boat, um, especially a key boat, I think you really need you, you obviously you gain a little bit going downwind from having a lighter boat, especially a planing boat. But if you don't have a planing boat downwind, uh, you definitely need upwind anyway. So more weight. Than, uh, what do you think? <laughs> My theory. Yeah. And, and another one. Sorry. Go for it. Uh, in terms of this, I mean, uh, a boat. Uh, six persons to handle the boat, right? But we don't we don't have all the experienced crew. We have three out of six. Yeah. So which position you prefer them? Well, uh, that is a difficult one, um, and depending on boat as well. But obviously you need to you, you need to work out uh, sail changes. So you know, bowman is always handy to have a, a pretty good bowman because. You know, if you need to get spinnakers down and all that, you need to have someone that knows what you're doing. Uh, and it's very, very difficult. Because you need, obviously, the, the better people you have, the faster the boat's going to go. But if you want to slot people in, I, I think you, I mean, I, I really think it's good to change around if you have sort of same crew going sailing all the time. Like you can try a bit of trimming, and you can try a little bit of this and a little bit of that, because uh, you just lift everyone as an experience. But if you have people, you know, if you have an absolute new guy on board, maybe you can help out. You know, be like a second trim on the jib, or, or uh, yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know what a good answer is to that. Try and lift everyone. You know, the, the, the better everyone is, the better the boat's going to sail. Helm, helm is usually the easy job. At the same time, it is very windy. 
if you've got a good helm, they can help out with the maneuvers. By just <laughs> because I usually put a uh, front window and back, which means it's the bowman, cockpit, and the helmsman. Yeah. Because there's a there's a total peak position. Um, if anything wrong, it will screw up the cell and and hit somebody, yeah. right? So you you, you maybe you sometimes trimming the the jib later, not accurately, but it's okay. Yeah. Just only the the bow speed. But you can all, yeah, that, that's probably a good theory. But you can also help each other out, like so. So the bowman doesn't really do much uh, upwind, so he can Shift. coach, you know, he can coach a trimmer. Uh, same with a, if, if ever the pitman doesn't do much either, you know, yeah. unless you <laughs> change out hole and stuff like that, I suppose. But um, you know, going upwind, if you do a long beat, then in a lot of attacks, it's going to be a lot of work for the the main trimmer and the and the jib trimmer, right? Uh, where everyone else can sort of relax and, and do little tactics and stuff, but they can coach, they can help out, you know, they can you know, go a bit more training or ease a bit more training and so on. And the crucial bit is going around the corners, I suppose, where uh, you, know, you need to hoist the sail and so on. Um, yeah. Yes? Where can we get help from if we really want to go back to basics and start? We need someone to have a get more practice and training on water. Is that should we go back to you or Donald or anyone else to have us on water? Good question. And it's depending on what you want to do. I think uh, I think there's a couple of um, you know sort of semi-pro sailors around the club, which I know the club have details of. That can sort of uh, you know you can hire help for a day and, and coaching for a day, uh, or you can just ask around and if there's someone. That you know wants to go for a sail and so we can help out a bit. You know? Or just ask the better boats. You know, ask the better boats in the class. If you're doing if you're doing class racing, I mean, I know everyone is doing this all the time, but uh, you know, you come back in after a sail and you, you stand on the dock for a couple of beers. <coughs> that's when you can really probe other sailors that are, you know, how they do it and so on. Because I don't think anyone is you know on cl club racing level. I don't think anyone sort of holds information to them. <coughs> Uh, so I think sharing within the class is a really good thing, and uh, yeah, that's Coach Colin, he's the expert. I'm just listening, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> he's always observing everything on the water, I was asking what happened. <laughs> yes? So, well, it's, uh, that's, uh, actually, so what's the best practice in all like this, uh, like, uh, boat management? I find this a lot, sometimes in the... Uh, in the sailing, there's a lot of argument, a lot of, you know, like, uh, shouting, <coughs> and also, you know, like, especially there's a, uh, a few experienced sailors, there's a lot of exchange ideas. Yeah. Sometimes I find more enjoyable when the boat, not many experienced sailors, you know, say maybe only one experienced <laughs> sailor tell me, you the final decision. So if you have uh, more than one, two experienced sailors, so what's the best yeah, practice to assign someone, say, that's the tactic, uh, just now the tactician, the final say, Sometimes not the helmsman have a final say, it's the owner of the boat have a final say. So, really confused. What's the best practice you say? That's a really good question. And, uh, How do you control the egos? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it comes down to crew roles. <coughs> who's, who's deciding what? Um, you know, quite often, you go sailing, and there's going to be bad decisions. It always happens. Mm. And when there's a bad decision, it's very easy to blame one person. You know, and it's very easy to question, you know, especially if you have a tactician that all he does on the boat is the tactics, right? Mm -hmm. If you go on the wrong side of the course, uh, it's very easy to blame the tactician, which we all know sailing is not always crystal clear, you know, you can have a, mm -hmm. a, a bad decision. And the same thing goes for, you know, the guy in the pit. Maybe he missed the halyard a little bit and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think everyone needs to own their role on the boat. And not, not really go into other people's role or criticize, should I say? Mm -hmm. You can always, you can always talk about things all the time, but you got to pick your moment, right? Mm -hmm. There's no point of arguing about mark rounding if it already happened and you need to sail fast again. Mm -hmm. You know, then you need to talk about speed on the boat, and then after you finish the race, you can talk about what went wrong, because things go wrong. You just need to pick your moment about mm -hmm. when to decide. But, but as you said, like, who takes what decision? Well, uh, you know, you need to you need to make this obvious before the start. 
if you have a tactician on board or if you have a, that does all the calls, the helmsman needs to listen to that tactician. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, yeah. you can't question him because there's no point in having a tactician. Exactly. Uh, if you have a helm that is doing the tactics and, and, and sort of broad strokes of that, uh, the other guys can't complain about that. You know, they can, you, you can lift the boat and the tactics by giving information. You know, if you're the bowman, you're like, oh, the right looks really good. You know, there's a nice uh, right hand shift over there. Uh, you can inform everyone else on the boat about that. But I don't think you should go, oh, we need to attack because the wind is better on that side. It, it doesn't work because you can't be too many people taking decisions. You need to just uh, rely on one person to, to take the decisions. If it's a bad decision, it's a bad decision, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, if, if you sail on a, on a happy boat, it's a lot easier to sail. You know, as I said, it, it's easier to sail with a, a, a boat that people don't know so much because yeah. they don't, you know, they have small egos. Uh, if you sail on a boat with big egos, oh, it's painful, you know? And uh, I prefer not to do it. Um, so that's, I suppose it comes down to your decision who you want to sell with. Yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, my, myself, I play golf. I can see I'm an experienced golfer. I hate people shouting at the caddy. Yeah. Sometimes ask the caddy, left or right. But you know, like, when you uh, putting yeah. a bit stronger, you can go left or right because it's a, a lot of variable. Yeah. Now, I find sometimes in the sailing, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the guy trip the sail, blaming the hemsman, you know, and then the hemsman, you know, say, blaming the, the people in the bow, you know, all yeah. sorts of stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of variable relationship. And a helm, a, helm, a helm making comments about the trim is a classic as well, you know? Mm -hmm. But, but the, the fact is that the helm actually feels the boat. So he can say, well, you know, I got a lot, of, a lot of pressure on my tiller now, which should sort of indicate to the trimmer, it's like, oh, you know, I used the main a little bit. Or, uh, or the main trimmer can go, how does the boat feel? You know, does it feel good? Does it feel fast? And then the helm, you know, might give him some feedback. Like, yeah, it's good, or no, we need more power, or whatever. You know, a, a constant dialogue on the boat, rather than telling people off what to do, I think is the healthy way to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Any, any, anyone else? No? All right, well, thanks for coming out. Thank you.